Texas Crossroads of North America by De Jesus F. De La Tea, Chapter 14, The Conundrum of Lyndon Johnson's Texas, 1960 to 1978. Don't go for it unless it's already in your pocket, Lyndon Johnson had advised Texas State Senator Barbara Jordan when she contemplated running for a seat in the U.S. Congress. Having the seat in her pocket must have been hard to imagine in her first two attempts to gain election to a Texas legislative seat in the early 1960s. Then the African-American attorney from Houston's 5th District had campaigned hard as part of a liberal Democratic coalition only to see many of the white males in the coalition get elected while she did not. At the time, her family, loving and supportive, but reflecting the traditional values of the era had encouraged her to curtail her political activity and think about getting married. The political picture for Jordan and other minority candidates had begun to change with the federal actions of the mid-1960s. The Voting Rights Act had struck down some of the barriers to voting African Americans had experienced the poll tax. That had kept many poor people and minorities from exercising their franchise had been abolished, and the Supreme Court had mandated re redistricting efforts, giving our urban areas with larger populations more representatives than rural areas and moving from at-large legislative seats to office holders representing specific areas. All of this meant that Jordan could run again in a new Houston 11th district with a significant percentage of African-American voters. In 1966, she won a state Senate seat and by 1972 had proven herself a skilled team player, enjoyed the support of former President Johnson and served as vice chair of the newest Senate redistricting panel, allowing her to help control the shape of her district shape her district would take. Running for the U.S. Congress seat from her district, she was opposed by another African-American legislator, Curtis Graves. She had such solid support, however, both within the Texas political power structure and within her home district, that she became the first black woman from a southern state to serve in Congress, the first African American elected to Congress from Texas and one of the only two African-American representatives elected from the South, which had not sent an African-American to Congress since 1900. Chosen to speak before the Democratic Convention in 1976, she would tell delegates Democratic Con National Convention in 1976. Oh, I'm so sorry. She would tell delegates, my presence here is one additional bit <clears throat> Of evidence that the African, or I'm sorry, that the American dream need not forever be deferred. Jordan's political success symbolized some of the changes that were taking place in Texas and the nation, but her victory did not necessarily mean that state politics as a whole would rely in similar fashion. Here's the sorry, calendar, the 1960s and 1970s were transitional years in Texas <clears throat> society and politics, mid-century establishments, conservatives operating under the banner, the factionalized Democratic Party faced new challenges from moderates and liberals and from women and ethnic minorities, all of whom proved more insistent on gaining equal social and political rights. During the 1960s, two related themes dominated state affairs, social protest and political reform. By 1972, economic and political power had shifted to the cities, raising the issues of urban poverty, crime, and pollution for Texas, problems that had long plagued urban centers in the eastern United States. No ideological unanimity prevailed regarding how best to solve these challenges. The rural political power structure was losing sway in Texas, but urban residents were not sing singularly aligned with the liberal wing of the state's Democratic Party. 
the new wealth created in Texas after the war years, and the new migrants to the state resulted in a continuum of political and social views. Finally, at the same time, Jordan and another liberal Democrats began changing the dynamics within their party. The Republicans gained a competitive foothold in the state. As you read this chapter, consider the following questions. Should the 1960s and 1970s be viewed as years of success or failure for the Texas Republican Party? Why? Compare and contrast the African-American civil rights movements, the feminist movement, and the Chicano movement in Texas in 1960s and 1970s, which faced the big, biggest obstacles. Why? Which was the most successful in achieving its aims? Why? What are the major political reforms of the 1960s and 1970s? Do they provide a larger legacy than the political scandals of the early 1970s? Why? Johnson had grown, the, I'm sorry, the Lyndon Johnson era. Johnson had grown up on in the Hill Country and graduated from Southwest Texas State Co Teachers College, now Texas State University in San Marcos, where he earned his elementary teacher's certificate in 1928. He spent a year as principal and teacher at Cotuya in South Texas, where the poverty of the students and their families were deeply impressed him, deeply impressed him. His first important political job in 1935 was as director of the National Youth Administration in Texas, a position that he left in 1937 to run for Congress and then for the Senate in 1948. The 1960 election Johnson apparently had the, his eyes on the, his, on the presidency all along and viewed the 1957 Civil Rights Act as necessary both for racial equality on the, in the South and for his political career. But race relations deteriorated following Arkansas Governor Orville Faubus' 1957 stand against the integration of Central High School in Little Rock. Johnson avoided any involvement with the crisis. He was able to regain significant ground when the Soviets launched Sputnik 1, the first artificial Earth satellite, later that year, and he seized the moment to convene hearings on its impact and the American response. He received a large part of the credit when the, Democratic, when the Democrats gained 28 seats in the Senate's in 19 in the 1958 midterm elections. Rather than immediately announce the presidency in 1960, Johnson remained in Washington presenting the image of a hardworking senator, senator doing his <clears throat> job. Speaker of the House Sam Rayburn, also a Texan, and others portrayed him as a seasoned leader whose accomplishments and wisdom made him a far better choice than the young and inexperienced John F. Kennedy of Massachusetts, who was already campaigning hard around the country. Johnson felt that Kennedy's weakness would become apparent during the campaign and that a deadlocked convention would then turn to him as the only truly qualified candidate to lead the party. He had protected the Senate, his Senate seat, however, by getting the Texas legislator to move the state's primary to May so that he could be a candidate for both the Senate and the presidency. Johnson's strategy overlooked some very basic challenge, changes in the manner which Americans elected presidents, namely the increased importance of presidential primary and the decline of the convention system. Because Kennedy gained enough delegates in the states that held primaries, he avoided a deadlocked convention nominated on the first ballot at the Los Angeles convention. Kennedy was shrewd enough to realize that he needed Johnson's help to carry Texas and other crucial southern states. He offered Johnson the vice presidential slot, and after adhering to the advice of Rayburn and other close advisors, Johnson accepted the Republicans nominated Vice President Richard Nixon for president for Henry, President and Henry Cabot Lodge III for Vice President. The 1960 campaign featured the first televised debates between presidential candidates. Everyone had predicted a close vote in Texas and an incident in, the, in Dallas may have swung it 
toward the Kennedy Johnson ticket. Campaigning with his wife, Lady Bird, in downtown Dallas, Johnson encountered some aggressive supporters of Dallas Republican Congressman Bruce Algar, who cursed them one of them hitting Lady Bird with a campaign sign, probably by accident, but the news media covered the event. And when the Algar camp showed little or no remorse, a number of voters probably expressed their disapproval at the ballot box. Another event that surely helped the Kennedy-Johnson ticket was Henry B. Gonzalez's gubernatorial campaign of 1958. Although Gonzalez had finished a poor second to incumbent Price Daniel, his political organization was still intact in 1960 and delivered a large percentage of the Hispanic vote to the Democrats, reversing the trend of the last two presidential elections. Uh, the Democrats carried Texas by fewer than 50,000 votes to out of almost 2.3 cast nationwide. The margin was only 118,574 votes out of the more than 68 million cast. Kennedy was actually a minority president garnering only 49.7% of the vote. Johnson had literally made it possible for him to become president the rise of the Republicans and the 1961 senatorial election. Although their party had lost the presidency, Texas Republicans saw the 1960 election as something of a turning point. Republican ideas showed no significant decline in popularity in the state as Nixon and Lodge had captured more votes in Texas than any Republican candidate ever had. John Tower, an unknown assistant professor from Midwestern University, now Midwestern State University in Wichita Falls, had polled more than 900,000 votes against Johnson for the Senate seat. A contest he lost. Moreover, the Republican Party was making a few inroads in selected pockets of the state, such as the Panhandle region of West Texas, where an avowed member of the right-wing John Birch Society was elected mayor of Amarillo in 1961. The Kennedy-Johnson victory made a special senatorial election necessary. Governor Daniel appointed William A. Dollar Bill Blakely to fill the seat until the election could be held in 1961. Ironically, Blakely had served the interim appointment in 1957 when Daniel resigned his Senate seat to become governor of Texas. Blakely was a businessman with investments in airlines and banking, and his political views were very conservative. Even when measured by Texas standards, the election was a wild affair. There were over 70 candidates with Tower as the lone Republican who vied for the seat given the growing number might of the Republican Party in the Senate, his this calculus did not bode well for the Democrats, a party that had been divided for the better part of the century and remained so in 1961. Tower had never really quit campaigning after the, his loss to Johnson in 1960, a contest in which he gained named name recognition. The leading Democratic contenders were Henry B. Gonzalez and... Mari Morvick Jr., both San Antonio liberals and Republican Jim Wright, a Fort Worth liberal with strong ties to organized labor. Given this three-way divide among the liberals and the excess of second and third tier candidates, the Democrats had little hope of defeating Tower in the first round of voting in a winner-take-all contest that only required a runoff if no candidate secured a majority of the votes. The two top, top vote getters were Blakely and Tower. Liberals were so enraged that they boycotted the runoff election, saying they would go fishing and seed the, that contest to Tower. They wrongly believed that they could easily beat Tower in 1966 when he would have to stand for re-election. Tower ran for an election campaign and defeated Blakely with a 54% of the vote to become the first Texas and Southern Republican senator since Reconstruction. He won re-election in 1966, 1972, and 1978. 
John Connolly and the Appeal to Minorities. As the Republicans became competitive in local and some statewide races, the Democrats engaged in division, divisive ideological and personal battles. 1962, John B. Connolly Jr. challenged five other candidates, including the incumbent Price Daniel for the governorship. Connolly had been a friend of Johnson's and had served as manager for all of of Johnson's major campaigns, so he had the makings of a statewide network in place. Many noticed a big difference between Connolly's campaign and previous Democratic establishment efforts. Johnson's election to the vice presidency, as well as the newly found potency, potency of the liberal wing of the party, evidenced by Ralph Yarborough's election to the Senate in 1957. Influence, Connolly had a moder moderate to openly court the, voter the votes of labor, African Americans and Hispanics after a close election. Connolly took office saying that he wanted to be the education governor because he believed that education was the key to addressing the pressing social problems of race relations and poverty. Johnson's unexpected ascension to the presidency following Kennedy's assassination less than a year into Connolly's term as governor changed the dynamics of Texas politics. Dallas, 1963, Kennedy assassination. In hindsight, many have suggested that the incident in which Johnson and his wife were jostled, particularly when coupled with a later incident in which UN ambassadors Alda, Adelai Stevenson were heckled and hit with a, a placard, was illustrative of the sentiment in Al Dallas in the early 1960s. Dallas was home to retired General Edwin A. Walker, who had resigned from the Army when he was reprimanded for distributing right-wing propaganda to his troops. General Walker had recently taken to flying the American flag upside down at his residence as a distress sign because of federal government's integration policy. Others of central, similar sentiment, such as H.L. Hunt, the wealthy oil man who financed extremely conservative causes, lived in Dallas. It was in this settling in this setting on November 22nd, 1963, that President Kennedy was assassinated as he rode in a motor car, motorcade through downtown Dallas. He had come to Texas primarily in an attempt to heal the liberal conservative ripped in the state Democratic Party and to raise funds for his coming re-election campaign in 1964. Riding in the same car with the president, Governor Connolly was seriously wounded by the same sniper, Lee Harvey Oswald, shooting from the Texas School Book Depository. Many blame the city's conservative for Ken conservatism for Kennedy's death, but the Warren Commission established immediately after the assassination concluded in 1964 that Oswald acted alone. In 1979, after reviewing the Warren Commission findings and gatherings new, gathering new information, the White House the House Select Committee on Assassinations concluded that Kennedy was probably killed as the result of a conspiracy, but was unable to identify any participants other than Oswald or the person or persons who planned the assassination. Despite passage of the President John F. Kennedy's Assassination Records Collection Act in 1992, which unsealed all of the federal records pertaining to Kennedy's assassination conspiracy, Theories continue to abound. Kennedy's assassination changed the course of both national and state politics. Lyndon Johnson became president and John F. Connolly, who had narrowly dis defeated a political unknown in 1962, now became virtually unbeatable as governor. He won re-election in 1964 by a three-to-one margin, and in 1966 with, with 72 percent of the vote, at the same time, Johnson's ascendance was set, a setback to state Republicans, and he, <clears throat> excuse me, momentarily stimmied their surge in Texas and quieted the battle within the state Democratic Party. Johnson led the Democratic ticket in 1964 against Republican Barry Goldwater of Arizona, defeating him by more than 700,000 votes in Texas and almost 16 million nationally. The future Republican President George 
H.W. Bush failed in his bid to unseat Yarborough in the Senate's race, and the Republicans lost both their of their congressional seats and all but one of their legislative offices. A Texan in the White House, safely elected on his own, President Johnson embarked upon an ambitious program. He had already signed the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the most far-reaching reach, civil rights act in the nation's history, which addressed voting rights, public accommodations, and discrimination, both in education and on the job. During his campaign in 1964, Johnson had begun to talk about the Great Society program, which would include a war on poverty. He viewed his electoral triumph in 1964 as a mandate to our Roosevelt, Franklin D. Roosevelt, the New Deal president who was in office when he came to Congress and who was his political hero, Johnson spoke unshamedly about poverty and why it was a major problem for American society. The last American president to, to do so in such bold problem, problem for American society the last American president to do so in, oh, I'm so sorry, such bold terms. In a campaign speech that year, Johnson had intoned, do something we can be proud of, help the weak and the meek, lift them up, help them train, and give them an education where they can make their own way instead of having to live off the bounty of our generosity. Other social programs included both included health care for elderly, Mal Medicare, and the neighborhood of Youth Corps. Education reform was important to the former school teacher and the Great Society included the Elementary and Secondary Education Acts. <clears throat> Legislation that made compliance with federal laws and prerequisite for gaining the new federal dollars. The result accelerated efforts to end segregated education in the South, including Texas, along with more than 200 other bills passed during Johnson's presidency. Congress enacted the Voting at Rights Act of 1965. The other bills included the National Museum Act, the Public Broadcasting Act, and the National Endowment for Art, the Arts and Humanities. A political columnist wrote in 1965 that Johnson's Great Society codified the New Deal vision of good society. At the same time, Lady Bird Johnson called attention to the environment with her well-received highway beautification program, which historian Louis L. Guild described as a new departure for the First Lady. The same is true for the work she did in beautifying Washington and its monumental areas and in its inner city ghettos, unquote, LBJ push for congressional passage of the other environmental and consumer protection laws, clean air, pesticide control, urban mass transit, wilderness area, water pollution, truth in packaging, traffic, and highway safety and scenic rivers and trails. Nothing in the Great Society was sufficient to counterbalance the ill effects of the growing war in Vietnam which ultimately divided the country and eroded Johnson's political base to the point that he declined to run for re-election in 1968. Political reform in Texas. The Great Society had an immediate impact on Texas Governor Connolly, had opposed to the opposed the public accommodation section of, 19, of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, but endorsed the Head Start program, thinking that Johnson might have taken the that idea the idea from a language program for Mexican-American children that he had begun in Texas and other areas of the domestic legislative package. However, Connolly feuded with Johnson because, in Connolly's view, they reduced the power of the state too much, and he acted, actually vetoed an 11-county neighborhood youth corps project drafted to take advantage of corresponding Great Society legislation. With his new popularity and the political assistance of a new Speaker of the House, his protege Ben Barnes, Connolly began to push his programs in higher education, increased tourism and recruitment of out-of-state industry, and he proved himself to be one of the ablest and most powerful of the state's 20th century governors. Connolly looked like most people thought. 
a Texas governor should, tall in his elegant boots, with his distinct with distinguished wavy gray hair frequently hidden under his white stetson, he was articulate and on occasion rose to the level of oratory. Dallas Morning News political reporter Richard Moorhead claimed that Connolly was the only governor in the nation who could hold his own with California Republican Governor Ronald Reagan at the annual governor's conferences where he frequently found himself defending Johnson's Politi policies against Reagan's charges. Now he applied that power of persuasion and salesmanship to implementing his campaign promises. Early in his term, uh, Connolly had described his goal to State Department counselor and later Johnson's aide, Walt W. Rostow, who he wanted to unify Texas and his opinion the best way to do that was to focus on higher education. There was plenty of room for imp improvement. 86% of the graduates of the University of Texas <clears throat> at Austin who pursued graduate studies did so elsewhere. Faculty salaries were 46 in the nation and New York produced five times more PhDs annually than did Texas. Connolly believed that education would be the engine that drove his other two goals. Connolly's record of achievement is, is impressive. He established coordinating board up for higher education and raised taxes so that he could increase faculty salaries in large campuses and create the University of Texas system in 1967. Under the leadership of his close friend, Frank C. Irwin, whom he appointed to the board of regents, appropriations for the flagship campus in Austin increased in little more than a decade from 40.4 to 349.7 million. The system's enrollment also increased rapidly from 29,940 to 77,437 during that same period. Connolly's program plus a large infusion of federal grants from the Great Society program also led to a major increase in medical research and the number of medical schools in the state. As World War II ended, the state had only a three medical schools, the University of Texas Medical Branch at Galveston Baylor College of Medicine in Houston and Southwestern Medical College in Dallas that graduated about 200 doctors per year not enough to care for the state's growing population with the availability of federal funding. However, Texas established four new schools during the 1960s and 1970s. Although it was a private institution, Baylor would begin to receive some state funds during the, late 19, during the 1980s. With increased federal financing for medical research, as well as the Lyndon B. Johnson Space Center, originally known as the Manned Spacecraft Center, which the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, had located near Houston. Doctors at several of the Texas medical schools produced significant me medical breakthroughs. Perhaps the best known were Michael E. DeBakery of Methodist Hospital and Denton Cooley of St. Luke's Hospital in Houston, who were in the forefront of heart surgery and transplants in the 1960s. DeBakery performed the first successful coronary artery bypass graft procedure in 1964, and Cooley performed the first heart transplant in the United States in 1968. Both continued their research by working on mechanical hearts in Dallas. Meanwhile, Joseph L. Goldstein and Michael S. Brown in the United States of Texas Health Science Center performs research in site physiology and medicine that would be recognized with the Nobel Prize in 1985. Such initiatives proved important to the increased diversification of the Texas economy. The civil rights movement intensifies. Coupled with these federal acts, African Americans and Hispanics continued to campaign for the equal for equal rights nonviolent protests that began in Greensboro, North Carolina in 1960 spread to Texas. Students at two historically African-American colleges, Wiley and Bishop, staged nonviolent demonstrations that year. And the following year, students at Texas Southern at the Uni University of Texas, North Texas State, and other colleges protested against segregated theaters and restaurants. Wiley and Bishop's 
colleges were both located in Marshall, Texas, a town of 25,000 located in deep Texas. Though the African-American population constituted 43% of the country's population, there was no eagerness to get out in front of the civil rights movement. Things were different for the college students who had less to lose. They were not employed in the town and they and were not be, beholden to the white power structure in the same way that my, the majority of the working class African-American population was. The local officials responded harshly to, I'm sorry, to the protesters turning fire hoses on them and resorting to other tactics common in the Deep South. A state-run investigation of the Wiley and Bishop College sit-ins contended that the movement was communist-inspired, a special, specious finding, but one that reflected the animosity of the local and the state government toward grassroots civil rights activists. The particular protest failed. Local businesses made no concessions to the student protesters. The unfortunate result suggests the similarity of Marshall with other small deep south towns where local officials used violence to foil civil rights protest efforts. Important civil rights reformers hailed from Texas, namely for James Farmer, who, had, who headed the Congress of Racial Equality Corps. Farmer grew up in Marshall, where his father was a professor at Wiley. Farmer graduated from Wiley in 1938 after leading the school's debate team to a victory over the Harvard University team in 1935. He then studied div divinity at, Har at Howard University and used the his understanding of Gandhi and pacification, pacifism to guide his civil in rights in initiatives. His most important initiative with CORE was the Freedom Rides in 1961. Fear of bad publicity and federal laws gradually brought segregation to an end in areas of Texas where the Deep South Moors of Marshall did not prevail. In Houston, for example, local business people quietly reached an agreement with a group of college students and community leaders that if they would not demonstrate public facilities, would be integrated while cities throughout the nation dissolved into confrontations and riots. For the most part, Texas cities remained calm. A comparable story of protest occurred in the Hispanic regions of Texas. During the 1960 presidential campaign, Viva Kennedy, Viva Johnson clubs brought more Hispanics into the pol political process. Meanwhile, in South Texas, the Political Association of Spanish-Speaking Organizations PASO, P-A-S-S-O, assisted by Teamsters officials, helped organize Hispanic voters in Crystal City in 1963. The overwhelming majority of residents, there were impoverished Mexican-Americans working for Del Monte Foods, Incorporated, and many of the employees had joined the Teamsters. The all new the new all Hispanic City Council held power for two years. The political transformation sent a message to the white minority population throughout the South throughout South Texas that their rule would no longer go unchallenged. Hispanics in Carrizo Springs and Cotuo also won political power. This newfound Hispanic activism resulted in one of Governor Connolly's most embarrassing moments in the summer of 1966 in an effort to get legislator, excuse me, to adopt a minimum wage of $1.25 per hour. Organizers in South Texas decided that to march the almost 500 miles from Rio Grande City to the capital to focus publicly publicity on the effort, sorry. Although he had planned out to be out to, of the Capitol building on Labor Day when the marchers were scheduled to arrive, Connolly told Speaker of the House, Ben Barnes, I don't think it's right for them to just march up here and nobody be here. With Barnes and Attorney General Wagner Carr in tow, he had he headed to New Bromf Bromfields where he found the 
bedraggled little band shaking hands all around, Connolly urged them to call off their march because things can get out of hand in marches. A veiled reference to the riots, violence, and bloodshed that had occurred throughout the nation and said that he would not receive them to, in Austin because he did not want to lend the dignity of his office to any such demonstration. When state labor leaders arrived at the scene, the mood turned more conf confrontational and developed into a standoff, and Connolly, Barnes, and Carr departed in their ex executive limousine. The marchers rallied and continued gathering supporters as they neared Austin, and as word of Connolly's rather high-handed attempt to stop them spread, Senator Yarbrough met the marchers at the Capitol on Labor Day, and with a number of supporters, including labor leader Cesar Chavez of the United Farm Workers and Connolly's brother Golfy, Golfrey, an economics professor at San Antonio College, the minimum wage law did not pass that year, but historian... Arnold de, Arnaldo de Leon considered this incident one of the formative events of the Chicano movement. Just as important was the process by which the Chicano middle class in Texas cities like San Antonio demanded reforms to open up a closed political machine that benefited an older style of crony politics. The demographic reform formed the good government league of the alamo city to lobby for reform african americans labor unions white liberals and chicanos ma made up this coalition one that suggested the ma major factions in the democratic party for the remainder of the century one of the beneficiaries of this process was henry b gonzalez who was elected to the u.s congress from San Antonio in 1961. Gonzalez had been criticized, though, for being too accommodating for the older Anglo power structure to the deficit of the Chicano working class and poor. The new left in Texas. The 1960s saw numerous groups challenging the political status quo on the state and the national level. In addition to the demands for equal political power, minorities, younger, college-educated Americans questioned the ethics of liberalism and the U.S. government. This movement, known as the New Left, is typically associated with elite East Coast and West Coast universities, such as Columbia University in New York and the University of California, Berkeley, as well as the University of Chicago. It also had deep roots in Texas, specifically at the University of Texas at Austin. White college students formed this movement because of their civil rights activism. The new left advocated a grassroots style, participatory democracy, and by the late 1960s, the movement ceased being a small cadar of intellectuals and swelled as college students across the country began protesting the Vietnam War. The new left differed sharply from the left of the 1930s and 1940s in that it saw college campuses and not labor unions at the center of its recruiting and intellectual base. Its philosophy challenged the alienation and anxiety associated with industrialization and abundance in American society, Arguing that its version of liberalism could save Americans from these problems, Austin was the largest center of new left activism in the South and outside of California. New York and Chicago, the most important in the country. Two national new left leaders honed their skills while students at the University of Texas, Casey Hayden and Jeff Shiro, Nightbird, historian Doug Rosano, explained that the Texas New Left followed a different trajectory from that found on the East and West Coast. They had few ties with the old left. They were kept skeptical of the right-wing anti-communists of the 1950s. They were sympathetic to the populist tradition of Texas, and they associated with the descendant Christianity. The source of Christian liberalism at Utah was the University YMCA, YWCA, 
students who came to the new left through this faith tradition believed in direct action saw racism as the most important social problem in the country faced and remained committed to the ex existential search for authenticity police departments in major cities throughout the state reacted with violence towered in the new left protesters and the Ku Klux Klan infiltrated department in Houston shot and killed one African-American activist and shot two others. As the decade wore on, both universities and the Vietnam War became significant new left targets. In 1967, the UT bureaucracy clamped down hard on new left activists. They're following a protest rally against Vice President Hubert Humphrey's visit to Austin. Regarding the war, the Texas New Left held control of the anti-war movement two years longer than was true on the coast. There, by 1965, anti-war activism had been taken over by those who did not share the anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist views of the New Left, nor did the shift in Texas result because of an abdication of New Left leadership but because of a rapid influx of new, less politically radical anti-war activists. Texas counterculture. By the 1970s, the new left Austin had morphed into a form of cultural liberalism that made the city unlike any other in the state. The celebration of individualism was central to this process. Austin's cultural liberalism included an attack on traditional sexual moral sexual mores and tol a tolerance for alternative lifestyles moreover one humorist wrote what can i tell you about austin this town this community is so organic people will turn to compost before your very eyes austin became a breeding ground for countercultural capitalism in the form of the austin based whole food supermarket chain an anti-union op operation that touted individualism as a reason for its low tolerance for unions. Music also played a role in the individualistic Austin-bred counterculture port author native jo Janis Joplin, perhaps one of the most important countercultural musicians of the 1960s, began her career playing at the Threadgill's restaurant in Austin. She was then a student at the University of Texas. Joplin led a tortured life uh, even as she earned a reputation as one of the best white blues singers ever. She died of a drug overdose in 1970. Finally, an Armadilla Armadil World Headquarters opened in Austin in 1970 to provide a venue for countercultural musicians. In addition to bringing important national acts like the Grateful Dead and Bruce Springsteen to Austin, the Armadillo also helped launch the careers of several musicians, including Stevie Ray Vaughan, Markea Ball, and Joe Eli. The mainstream arts and popular sports. Connolly's Establishment of the Texas Fine Arts Commission, now the Texas Commission of Arts, 1965, which also receives funds through the National Endowment for the Arts, called for attention to the state's growing cultural facilities. Long famous for its philanthropist, Texas is fortunate that a number of them chose to establish museums. One of the first to do so was Jesse Marion Kugler McNay of San Antonio, who left her Mexican Mediterranean style mansion and art collection as a private museum, which opened in 1954. The Amand Carter Museum, designed by New York architect Philip Johnson, followed in 1961. Five years later, the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston opened Bayou Bend, the mansion that architect John F. Staub had designed for Imahog. I'm sorry, I'm a, yeah, I'm a hog and her brothers. <clears throat> As a decorative art center, perhaps the best known of the Texas Museum is the Kimball Art Museum in Fort Worth, which opened in 1972, but one of the most eclectic, which opened to the public in 1978. 
is the Stark Museum of Art in Orange containing H.J. Lucher, Stark's vast collections of Americana. Museums also seemed to lead the way for modern architecture in the state. In 1950, John Dominique de Mignel hired architect Philip J. Johnson to design an international style house for them in Houston. He went on to design the campus plan and several of the buildings up for the University of St. Thomas in Houston in 1958, the same year that Ludwig Mies van der Rohe, one of her one of the pioneers of the international style, designed Colonnan Hall as an addition to the Museum of Fine Arts. At the same time, San Antonio architect O'Neill Ford was designing the campus of Trinity. University with the revolutionary lift slab construction technique that cut building costs considerably. Other distinguished architecture can be seen in San Antonio Art Museum, which moved into the spectacularly renovated Lone Star Brewery in 1981. The new 1984 Dallas Museum of Art designed by Edward Larrabee Barnes, the Lewis Kahn designed Kimball Art Museum in Fort Worth, and the new Museum of Fine Arts and the Minnell Collection in Houston. During the late 20th century, perhaps the most recognizable building in the state after the Alamo was the Astrodome, the world's first fully air-conditioned, enclosed dome, multi-purpose sports stadium, which opened as the home of the Houston Astros baseball team in 1965. The team was created four years earlier as the Houston Colt 45s, gain, gaining its new name with its new stadium. When it was determined that baseball players could not see fly balls against the bright glare of the plastic roof and crisscross girders during the day, light, Judge Roy M. Hopines, head of the Houston Sports Association, ordered the roof painted. The lack of sunlight meant that natural grass could not grow in the stadium. So in a well-publicized event, Hop and Hines obtained an artificial grass called AstroTurf. The Houston Oilers football team played there until moving, moving to Nashville in 1997, and the Domed Stadium has hosted dozens of other sporting events, as well as concerts, conventions, and religious meetings. Today, the Astrodome is a relic with both the Astros and the Houston, Texas football team playing in other stadiums. Houston was not the only sports city in Texas with an expanding national president presence, nor was it the first Texas city to earn itself for itself a professional football team. For one year in 1952, a team called the, I'm sorry, a team called the Texans played in Dallas. This team had previously played in the National Football League as the New York Yanks. It had little success and was sold and reconstructed as the Baltimore Colts. Later in 1959, Houston businessman Bud Adams worked with Dallas businessman Lamar Hunt to, own, to found the American Football League with teams placed in the two cities. The Oilers in Houston and the Texans, a different team in Dallas. <clears throat> the Oilers were successful in the AFL, but the Texans did not fare well in Dallas. <clears throat> Excuse me. We're an NFL expansion team that Clint Merchinson <clears throat> Jr. started in 1960. The Cowboys seemed the more popular with fans. 1963, the Texans relocated to Kansas City, becoming the Chiefs. Texas sports teams have not only done well in their respective leagues, but also have become another key factor in the gradual 20th century rebranding of the state as something apart from its rural southern roots. The most successful, loved and by some and hated by others, is the Cowboys. Dubbed America's team in 1978, the Cowboys have won five of the eight Super Bowls in which they played while the Oilers near, never advanced to a Super Bowl game. Other major league sports franchises in the state included the Texas Rangers baseball team, which moved to Arlington in 1972, three successful National Basketball Association teams, the San Antonio Spurs with five championships, the Houston Rockets with two, and the Dallas Mavericks with one and one National Hockey League team. The Dallas Stars, which won the Stanley Cup championship 
once at the end of this century. Let's, okay. Once at the end of the century. This will be the end of chapter 14, part one. Thank you.